All right, so I'm Bob Herklotz. Um, as, as you look at the title there, if you got any questions, what that means is my program deals with cybersecurity. Uh, at first, I'll try to cover some background and context of what I'm trying to do in the, in the program. Uh, I'll present some highlights, a lot of them for a specific reason throughout, and uh, no great intent to go too deeply into stuff. Uh, every time I go over this, I go, oh, it's long. So <laughs> we'll see what happens. All right, next. All right, so the program is uh, brief description. Fun science that will enable Air Force and DOD to dominate cyberspace. Science to develop secure information systems for our warfighters and to deny the enemy such systems. Okay, so the hint there is cybersecurity is a team sport. I work with uh, DARPA, IARPA, ARO, ONR, NSA, DHS, NIST, NSF, and uh, asdr &E pretty much tries to keep us all working together and over the last 12 years I've been a program manager that's been working pretty good. Or let's say it's developed to where it's working pretty good. Okay. Um, what's the problem? Well, the problem is uh, cybersecurity has kind of been approached in an ad hoc manner in the past. So somebody finds a vulnerability in one of our systems, you know, hardware, software, networks, human, okay. And uh, next thing we have malware in our system and it's doing something. Uh, <clears throat> first problem is let's detect it. Sometimes it's in there for a long time doing something and we don't know about it. So we detect it. That's hopefully we can capture the software because it's pretty smart and likes to disappear. Then we can reverse engineer it. It's usually designed not to let you do that very good. And we finally figure out what it does and what it's been trying to do and try to patch, invent a fix to it and then go patch our systems. Okay, so that's the thing. So we, after months, we get to the point where we got this patch, we try to deploy our patch. First one to buy a patch is the attacker. Of course, in the interim, it's pretty much insecure, right? We haven't done anything yet to make it more secure. And uh, he buys a patch. He, he's very agile and he goes, whoa, that's what they're gonna do? <laughs> he laughs a little bit and he has a workaround to another vulnerability or the same one a different way. And you know, it's an asymmetry that we have that's, that's part of, we're trying to defend a huge system and uh, uh, everywhere. So, so that's the problem. So a few years ago, uh, equivalent of the science board, but for the uh, Intel guys, kind of said is, you know, we're tired of this attack, patch, attack. And we keep losing, it doesn't seem to get any better and those guys that, care about return on investment, keep saying, you spent all this money and it's not any better, or it doesn't appear to be any better. Uh, we'll talk about metrics later about whether it appears or what that means, if you can even measure it. And, um, and so, uh, they said, is, isn't there some more scientific basis to the security? And part of the problem is we did, did some studies and in the same study, they come back and define cybersecurity three different ways in the same piece of paper. So nobody had a formal definition of what they mean by security to begin with. And so, uh, so it was decided we had a workshop, uh, invited a bunch of academics and other people to come in and brief on this. About out of 40 people, there was probably 10 that kind of <laughs> got the idea. We want something deeper than, yes, I figured out how to defend against the attack of the day, you know, in what I thought was fast fashion. Uh, so since then, uh, between myself and uh, NSA, we've probably funded a few of those people. We decided we should do a, a MURI, put a bunch of money on it. I'd already put some money on it. And, uh, and so uh, we've decided to go deeply into the, trying to develop a science of security. Okay. So that's kind of the problem. What we would really like the science of security to do is tell us how to uh, uh, build 
in an inherently secure system, a perfectly secure system. Okay? You gotta define security, you liked all those rules. Ah. So let's say we're gonna, and we are, spending a lot of money, or starting to spend a lot of money to do that. Comes back to that problem again is, well, even if I knew how to do it, you know, these systems we're talking about are huge, millions and millions, maybe billions of lines of code when you link at all the systems and systems together, right? And uh, really, are we good, that good, even if we knew how to build it perfectly, that we can actually build it perfectly, that we haven't left some errors in there? Not only that, you know, they aren't static systems, they're dynamic systems, so we're always changing them anyway. Can we continue this over the lifetime and keeping them up to speed? And even when, if we know what we need to change to make it secure, uh, can we execute that, right? Uh, so we got sheer size, we got, it's huge and hard to keep up. Uh, we got the asymmetry I talked about already of the attacker, he's much more agile than the federal government and its ability to acquire something and actually get it out there. So the problem is not only do we need to know how to build something perfectly secure, but we need to know kind of a backup strategy of what to do considering that most of the time we're going to be working on an insecure system anyway. And how do we continue to operate and do what we need to do until we invent the science of security and until, uh, you know, hopefully systems get better when we do or if we do. And, uh, but there still be vulnerabilities there. So we spent quite a bit of the last year working with DOD, uh, uh, building up their latest strategy. I'm gonna, I'm gonna call it what it is, the latest buzzwords of cybersecurity. And they came up with, well, we need resilient systems, I think. Somebody asked about resiliency. And that means you have a system that, uh, is not secure or possibly not secure, and how do I still execute the mission on that? Uh, agility. Well, you know, the attacker has to find uh, a vulnerability in your system and attack that. If you actually move things around, like artificial diversity, or maybe IP hopping, or a whole bunch of other techniques, can you move the target he's after, okay, faster than he can come up with the latest attack and slow him down? And then, of course, uh, what are we really defending? We're not defending the whole network just because we love our whole network of all these systems. We really want to defend the important mission that we're executing, probably only on some portion of that network, okay? So all we need to do is, for the time that mission is important, defend some portion of the network securely, okay? So we can make a smaller target, Okay, we can move around and make it hard for him to attack. We can try to fight through uh, the attacks that are already ongoing or have been successful. So that's kind of the backup strategy until we can invent, uh, learn how to, and build purely secure systems. So that's the big background. That's kind of the latest strategy. And like I kind of hinted, a lot of these terms will come up again, and you'll see as we've been thinking about these things for a long time, just change the words every now and then. Okay, next. All right, so what am I doing specifically in my program? Because that's a lot of stuff. It's a team sport. So I'm, I was asked by DOD to, to lead writing this MURI for the science of security. So that's the main, I'm, I'm moving most of my program into the, the, the um, formally developing it. Okay. And we have this other little problem of covert channels, okay, that aren't really exactly part of the system I planned, but are kind of back doors. So we'd like to understand them. And then, of course, down to the, what are we really trying to defend is that mission. How do we execute the mission on insecure components? Okay. So. I'm going to talk about these three main thrusts, and, and now we're going to go into some more specifically onto, into some programs, and I'll try to talk about them in relation to those thrusts. Next. So, <clears throat> the science of cybersecurity. 
What are we trying to do? Well, we're trying to develop some laws of security, okay? Laws are theories that are predictive. You know, we like to analyze an artifact system, that's what that is, or subsystem, and predict its properties, you know, what it does, and how well does it do it, okay? So we can understand it in relation to maybe a lot of properties, security being one of them, okay? Synthesis, if we got a bunch of subcomponents that we put together or systems of systems, and we did the first part and we understand how they work, it would be real nice if we don't have to start over again because we have this big dynamical system that's always changing and so that what we know already, we can, under, we can analyze and quickly understand what the, the uh, composed system, what its properties are. Next. So, let's go, the laws about what in more detail. So, if you consider Yeah, my notes, and it, I guarantee it'll be too long if I don't use my notes. Uh, uh, <clears throat> the the uh, kind of the features of a cyber system, okay, that we're interested in with respect to security. Let's say this is our domain, the features of our domain, and they're kind of characterized, one way to look at it is by classes of policies. Talking about security policies, okay? Classes of attacks, how, how one could attack, and classes of different defenses I have. So it would be real nice to be able to uh, understand what defense class D enforces policy P despite attacks from class A in the system I'm looking at today, okay? And that way, I could compare architectures or systems and, and know if I build it this way, it's, you know, let's say, it's uh, secure against all the classes I know or most of the classes I know uh, uh, <clears throat> if I use certain policies. And, and if I'm dynamic and I change things, I can understand where I'm switching, if I could understand that. Okay, next. All right, so we started a MURI on the science of security. These are the people. This includes most of the people who, since that first workshop, were actually interested in going deeper. Lead is John Mitchell. I think it's a pretty good group from Stanford, Berkeley, Carnegie Mellon, Cornell, UPenn. Pretty much the elite. Next. Okay, so what are these guys doing? Uh, and this, by the way, this MURI just started, supposed to start in July. Kickoff was at the end of September. They actually got money about December. Don't ask me about that. Okay, so what are they doing? They want to advance the science base for trustworthiness, another term for security, cybersecurity, by developing concepts, relationships, laws with predictive value, okay? And first part, they are going to look at modeling, okay? And this is kind of deeply understanding those relationships that I was just talking about. And composition, we talked about, I understand them for the parts and I start putting them together and build. Do I have to do it all over again, or can I uh, uh, understand what the final result will be with the analysis I already did? And then this last one is security measurement, okay, which you heard a lot about measurement already in the first talk. Uh, goals include determining relative strength of defenses, et cetera. This is metrics. This is a thing that everybody's beaten us over the head for years. Everybody's tried to have programs in, and uh, in fact, that was a study where they couldn't define security but three different ways on what a metric was. And I'm going to say, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that and what we're starting there to give you the flavor of, we're trying to start from basics, from first principles and our work our way up to understand this uh, science of cybersecurity. <coughs> so, in my opinion, metrics have kind of been from the top down. Somebody has an idea, 
and they come up with some number somewhere. And then you go, does that mean anything is, uh, I detected more attacks this year, am I really more secure? Or does that just mean I wasn't very good at detecting last year? Or there's a lot more people attacking me? Or whatever, and probably the answer is, in the really smart ones, you haven't detected them at all either year. So be worried. I tell my wife, be afraid, be very afraid. OK. <clears throat> so these guys are going to work on a bottoms-up approach. Define security. Define the properties of the system. Look at the relationships. Next. OK, so Fred Schneider from Cornell is working this thrust of the Murray. Next. And of course, how does this fit into what I just told you? Well, he's talking about it's a quantitative property. How well does it work? So what we really want here is we want to understand what class of analysis laws commonly called security metrics should look like. Back to the theory, right? Next. So uh, starting, you'd kind of like to know um, what properties you would ha have to have to have a good security metric. And, and that might depend on who wants to use it for what. And there's a few different groups of people that might be interested in, in different metrics. And we'd like to understand how you would, what metrics would fit each one. General, overall, basic. What are we thinking about? Next. So if uh, mu is our security metric, you know, the first thing we'd like, it's a function against some system S. You know, it gives you some value of use, right? Produces some value. So our metric is mu. It'd be real nice if you were going to compare two systems, right? That if mu of S and system S prime is if there was, you could order the results of your function. You know, now I didn't say whether that's a percent or a alphanumeric good, bad, B plus, A minus, whatever, but it'd be nice to be able to at least partially order whatever your measure. So that's two things you want out of a metric. Well, it'd also be real nice if it was efficient to compute just your function on your system, right? If you can't compute it, you don't really have a metric. And, and similarly, it'd be nice if it's efficient to do this ordering, okay? Next. Now, how is a metric? It not have anything to do with security yet. So now we gotta kind of define what we mean by security. And so, <coughs> if we define in the first, our little double less than symbol or whatever, is that's security, that's uh, known security. Maybe you got an oracle tells you, this one is more secure than that. What we want is, other than a more oracle, we want to develop how we can prove that, okay? And that implies some soundness and completeness properties of our system if we have that. Now, how do we get that next? Well, you kind of define your system. You got to talk apples and apples. So you got to make sure the specification of the two systems you're looking at are exactly the same, okay? And it kind of talks about it here. The interactions with the system involve actions at the interface. Okay, the specification defines this interface. And specification describes expected effects of actions at the interface. What is an attack? An attack is an input that causes the specification to be violated. Okay, so now we're kind of digging into what this means. Next. Okay. <clears throat> so, you know, they just, they just got money in December. This is just the first thought, okay, of how we're going to develop this. And I just want to give you a flavor. Going back to first principles, bottoms up, not tops down. I want to count attacks or whatever my current sensors can collect and try to guess what that really means across the whole system. But we like to derive what it means. And <coughs> their first feeling is expressive specifications imply a security metric that may be undecidable or incomplete. 
And what he means there is that uh, a broadly applicable metric, okay? Kind of, kind of like the halting problem in software, right? How do I know that a uh, arbitrary uh, computer program, arbitrary is the key, whether it'll actually continue to operate forever and never come up with an answer or whether it'll end and give you the answer. And so that, that's his analogy of what they're kind of, is it, if you get too broad, you may not learn anything. Okay, and uh, so it'll probably be, we're going to have to pick categories, narrowly define them, and then we can tell you specific things about those categories. Maybe this set of uh, attacks versus a set of defenses, you know, for category A or B or C or something like that, as opposed to all attacks. Next. All right. So that's the feel for what we're doing in science and security. This next one, now we're, we're jumping around. So we, we talked about science and security. This is about covert channels. Okay. And these guys from uh, <coughs> uh, Maryland have been working this area for a while. Uh, has to do with steganography and steganalysis in general, but kind of a spin off of that. Next. Okay, so what they were interested in, the original topic was uh, anti forensics in, in multimedia. And what's going on if, what's, in this case, they were looking at images. If you have an image, uh, every part of its lifetime uh, leaves uh, impacts on the digital nature of that image. So the original camera or sensor that collected it is unique. And then if you st every time you process that data, you copy it, you uh, compress it, you do wh whatever you do to it, it's going to leave some more artifacts in that image. And that way, you can kind of follow the history of the image all along. Might be nice to do that. It's kind of a built-in watermark. On the other hand is if you want to, you're an attacker and you want to change a few things in that image, you would like to do it in such a way that you haven't screwed up this kind of natural mortar mark that's in there. So they were looking at the anti-forensics from the attacker side. How can I change something and not get caught? And in doing that, you know, uh, they came across a new signature. And that's the natural fingerprint of the power grid that was supplying power or that the sensor was in the field of the power grid when it was, uh, when the original image, in this case, was collected. Next. Uh, click and fill up this page. There you go. Okay. So, uh, electrical network frequency, you know, pretty standard. It's different in different places. And not only that, uh, it varies. You know, these power plants aren't perfect. And it varies, okay, slightly over time. So the results of that variation is actually embedded in that image and in the audio and probably in pick another sensor, right? And so the result of that is, next, if I had a model of the power ENF signal, you know, if I had the data of how the network was working over the last year, then I could match that to what I see in my picture or data. And, uh, you know, that would tell me some, might tell me something about where it was recorded and when it was recorded. Next. Okay. And if I looked at that and I saw, gee, that ENF signal has changed somewhere in the middle of my data or somewhere in my data, that might tell you somebody has change something in your data, right, at a later time. Next. Um, the audio and video tracks, if you got two of those, if you got one of each, you could compare and uh, and the same thing is, if one of those, the ENF, doesn't match the other ENF, maybe somebody's put some new audio on an old picture. Next. The big thing with that is not so much we discovered that, is 
What other phenomenon do that? It's kind of a hidden channel. I already had two different guys suggest, hey, we ought to look at this or that or the other thing. So. All right, next. All right, I, I, <coughs> I threw this one in because I wanted to tell a story of Kisuk up at, uh, at uh, RI, Rome, New York. A couple of years ago, or I guess about five years ago, we, I started funner <coughs> to do botnet research. Okay, and true, other parts of DOD uh, were ahead, but the Air Force needed to play in this. She built herself, or I, I guess I gave her the money to build a, a botnet lab. She made big teaming arrangements with all kinds of university professors, and she built her niche with the botnet community. As we're moving now into uh, cloud computing, okay, there's a relationship there, and she's transforming this into what she's calling cloud auditing, with the same group of looking at the security of those botnets. Next. Just as an example, and this is why I threw out the huge team of people she has built, in addition to the other agencies people that she works with. But these are mostly university uh, performers, many of which have spent at least one summer, if not multiple summers, up at Rome to work on this problem and provide data. Next. And here's kind of a list that you can look at later of all the related research topics that all this team is, is working on. It's of use in the cloud arena. Next. So it's a, it's a team building whatever. We've made the investment and now we built this really good group. All right. Next topic. This one deals with um, hardware. And uh, hardware has been a big problem for a long time uh, since <coughs> We don't build most of our chips here in the States. We have a few foundries that we think are secure. But as soon as you put that chip someplace, you never know what it is the day after you put it in something. So anyway, so a couple years ago, and there was, a, I think, a SAB study on hardware security. And John Bay said, you know, you ought to invest some stuff in hardware security. So, so we started a few programs in hardware security. This is one of them. Uh, I put this one in here because I'll go a little bit into his approach. And uh, I'd say he's been visited by other three-letter people who came to my annual meeting, who come to my annual meeting every year, and they thought that might be interesting. All right. So in hardware, there's uh, three kind of vulnerability vectors. You know, one is a, a functional vector, and that means I just take that chip and I add a few actual circuits, add some extra hardware on that chip. Another one is parametric, which means I diddle with that circuit as I'm printing it, or, you know, more, <laughs> more delicately building it. And, you know, if I make a few wires thin in the right place, it just might burn out, okay, quicker than one would like. And, and the other one is an implementation attack, which I've kind of talked about somewhat before. And, uh, and if you use models of autonoma, autonoma ugh, to, uh, to model what you're, what you're trying to embed on that chip as the functions of it, when you go to build it, you know you can... Uh, Modify an automaton to do everything it's supposed to do and a few extra things. And how do you know? Looks the same. Just how everything is hooked up together there. So the key is, in the implementation attack, you take the same chip. It does everything functionally that you designed. And you just tweak a couple things to add a few extra things, like your malware. Next, so how would you detect that? Next. Did it freeze? All right. <laughs> All right, we'll see how long it sits there. In any case, um, 
like I said, I'm going to talk about these implementation attacks. I already mentioned to you that it does everything it's supposed to do that you designed it to do against your spec, and it just has a few extra things that are, have some kind of trigger. So if you're using fuzz testing or something like that, you might get lucky and trigger something weird, but chances are, you know, you won't with it in the infinite possibilities. And the other thing that's kind of interesting is when we design a chip, we like to optimize what it does. So we kind of build, it has all kinds of extra capacity so we can optimize for how much uh, maybe energy it uses or how fast it does some functions or whatever else. So we um, leave a lot of options in how you can optimize that chip. And of course, in that kind of don't care space of this optimization, that's where you can embed something that you'll never trigger because even if something shows up, is all that we don't care what that does. It dumps someplace, and now it triggers something else. So how would you catch that? Did it start moving? Okay. Uh, next. Okay. So I got up to here. Okay. And I think I said the key there is this don't care space. Next. Okay, so let me try to explain what I'm talking about a little bit more. Oh, it works. Okay, if all the different ways valid implementation of that circuit is the big outer thing, and then, you know, how I would like to optimize it is in blue to do my functions that I originally designed that I want to use a chip for. And the bad guy, you know, there's some overlap with all the things he would like to do. And of course, this boundary, we don't know where that is exactly. That's the hard part. So in, you know, in a general case, this is insoluble. Okay? We, can't, we don't know where the boundary is. How do we know which where we are? He could probably sneak something in. But in real case, what do we really do? We have design tools that do that optimization. And they produce, think of, they produce these little oddball shapes I got in here in my big optimization thing. So I'm looking at it, my current design tools. What are they doing? Okay, you know, and some of those are secure and some of them seem to hit here. And how would we know if we're here and know I want to switch and let's use this tool instead of that tool? It doesn't live there. Okay, so that was his idea. What design approaches can I use to understand this? Next. Okay, so what he's looking at, you can't look at the function, but uh, can we identify structural characteristics of service that result from a standard design approach but are removed or altered by the slight tampering that I did? Okay? And if I can do that, I can check for these, uh, these uh, uh, things that should not be changed by tampering. And if they're still there, then it hasn't been tampered. And if they're gone, it has. So I have to check for those. Next. Okay. And uh, so that's his idea. He's working on that. Uh, the, the formal area is called structural circuit analysis that he's using. Next. Okay. I threw this one in for detecting hidden protocols. Is, uh, this is kind of interesting. Uh, the guy's looking at how you can break Tor networks. Okay. So you got an onion router, you try and send something securely. You send it through many places and every one of them is uh, uh, encrypted a different way and it's really hard to do this. Well, he was looking at that problem and uh, pretty much solved it. That's not the key. The value and the reason I threw it up here was is there again is this results of this have transferred to a couple classified programs and to the Navy and has resulted in three or four of his students working for the federal government. So I'm going to say victory on we got some smart guys who know something about cybersecurity. Next. Okay. This is an interesting one. This is part of uh, security is understanding the attacker. Okay, so we try to, I, I try to word that as we try to uh, anticipate the next attack. So 
in this one we're looking at uh, uh, anticipating future attacks. Next. Okay. So we're looking at uh, attacks upon signature matchers. So basically you defend things as you get a signature, okay? And you look for the signature of the bad guy's uh, virus or whatever. Yep. You look for that signature. Uh, if you find it, you know, that's your virus checker. Uh, so they're real clever. You know, they use all kinds of morphisms here to randomly change their payload. This is the malware, and this is the bad guy keeps changing that. His problem is, you know, it's always non-deterministic, you randomly, whatever else. And from his standpoint, the weakness is he's got this undirected mutation and the thing is spreading, but he is losing control because he wants control. Who knows, he wants to add some functionality to that later on. Next. Okay. So, as an attacker, what would you like to do? You'd like to know what defenses, what signatures are you currently looking? Well, you can buy some of that. Uh, mine that and figure out a mutation strategy that that's, doesn't have to be random so I know what it is and I can control it. Next. All right. The key is the software companies are building these signature things. They don't give out their latest signature database probably it could be stolen. But they do provide places on the web where you can send in something you suspect and they'll check it for you. An oracle. Okay? Hey, as an attacker, what's the best thing? I got something new, send it in there. Oh no, it looks okay to us. Next attack. So that's his idea. There again is, that is already transitioned to the army and several other places. Next. Uh, okay, no, go back one. All right, so this is another Murray. This one is about um, execute on insecure systems. Started a couple years ago, and basically it's aimed at if you're if you suspect your uh, operating system may be insecure, what do you do about it? Nice group of people there that are working on that. Next, uh, and they have several approaches. So they're attacking in many ways, many different approaches. That's all I wanted to show is we're already working on how you operate on insecure systems. Attacking it broadly, next, next. All right, well, maybe, if, maybe if I even have a picture on there, it takes some time. All right, so just if you look at four different areas that we're working on, you know, these parts of the MURI are working on enforced properties on a malicious operating system. These are things that prevent exfiltration of data, and this is things that, tools that may enable complex distributed systems reliance on hostile operating systems. Okay, so working at broadly attacking that problem. Next. All right, and this I'm going to say I think is my last, I can't believe this could be almost on time. Okay, and this again is execute on insecure systems. What was the question? Resilience, the latest buzz term. This, this MURI is in its last year, will end in June. Okay, so we've been working on this for at least six years, maybe seven when, whenever we started the, the uh, writing the topic. The topic was jointly written by uh, guys from uh, Rome, RI, and myself. Okay, so we've been, you know, latest buzz terms, whatever. We've been working on resilience for a long time. Next. This is the group of people that work on it. It was so big I couldn't fit it on the front page. Next. And I just wanted to mention this one highlight. They developed uh, a genetic programming algorithm that once you're attacked and you figure out what the problem is, where the, what part of your code you have a vulnerability, but not the exact part, is they can use genetic programming to build a new piece of code that'll fit there and work sometimes in seconds, so you could patch it in seconds. It's also useful if you want to do a proactive diversity invariant, you can create a lot of variants automatically to do the same function as that original piece of code. So among all the other things that have tr transitioned out of this program already, that I thought was a nice highlight. Uh, there's an IARPA program that a lot of that is in, and uh, I think that was my last one.
exactly on time. Unbelievable. Well, did anybody write in any questions? I didn't get any. <laughs> Does anybody have there? I would say, uh, oh, yeah, up front, I've been briefing the. Okay, so how did I decide what the three thrusts of my uh, program were? And I think I mentioned up front that for years I've been working with all the other agencies in this field, that it's a team game, the cybersecurity. And uh, over that time, I decided that that was a good niche that nobody else, or those areas were niches that nobody else was uh, claiming and, and that were of use. Okay, I had some on the, uh, on let's say the uh, covert channels, there was some pushback for a while until finally, and the way I worked that is, is Chad Heisenreiter up at up at Rome, and there's two people before him, they keep changing, but Chad is the current guy that goes out and talks to all these other agencies that use this stuff. And at first they, their co complaint was, damn, he's going so fast we can't keep up with it. And then we said, the argued is, well, do you want to know where the leading edge is first before anybody else, or do you want to be second and be surprised? They said, oh, okay. So then people stopped complaining about that. And, and, and for a while, I know for sure the Army got out of it. And I think I've, I've driven it more, not let's the, what's the latest uh, steganography algorithm, but what's the theory of that and what is possible, okay? And uh, I think uh, we've, we've funded the leading edge on theory on those. Today, uh, let's see what was the other one. The, uh, science and security. I was always interested. We went to the workshop. Fred Schneider had been unbeknownst to me, but I've been fun of him for ten years, and was and always in my. If you go back to all my things, I always say we're looking for the holy grail of how do we design inherently secure systems. Okay, I I always briefed that. So when the science and security came up three three and a half years ago. Guess who got invited to give the keynote talk at that? I wasn't even funding it, okay? And uh, who had many of the ideas you already saw here today. So you could say it was serendipitous, or you could say as we were investing with a smart guy all along, the Air Force doing the right thing, and then who got asked to lead the project by DOD essentially it was me. You know, as soon as we had that meeting, we saw there was interest in it. Hyper properties came up before. I didn't talk about that because I talked about it last year. It's very useful in proving a lot of these basic things. It will be basically in there. The stuff, the Fred student was that, you know, whose thesis was the invention of those, uh, had just graduated. I immediately funded him as a postdoc to stay with Fred for two years. He just moved this year to George Washington. He's a yip. As soon as they announced he's a yip, NSA said, called me up and said, can I do an added task onto that stuff? We want some more hyper property work too. So I think we earned it. That's, that's how I would describe it. Others can say whatever they want. 